Uh, my name is Leah Hellerstein. I am the program director at Myotonic. And I've been for, at the organization for about two years now. I am in charge of resources and making sure the community has what they need in terms of guidelines, toolkits, and our conference and, and regional conferences as well. So I'm very excited to welcome you today to our third webinar in our series of Friday afternoon webinars. Just to give a quick background about Myotonic, also known as the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation, we are an organization, a nonprofit that was founded in 2007 by families with DM seeking support and a cure. Our mission is care and a cure and is to enhance the quality of life of people living with myotonic dystrophy and accelerate research and treatments towards a cure. Our work focuses on support and education, resource research and advocacy. Just to let you know about some of the resources that we have available, we have our toolkits and publications that are available on our myotonic.org slash toolkits and publications page. If you haven't had a chance to look at them, we suggest you do. There's a lot of great information there. We also have a variety of virtual support groups and Facebook chats that are located on our find support page on the website. We've added a few more virtual support groups and, and chats in response to COVID-19. So we hope you can join us for one of those. All of our calendar uh, resources and activities are listed at the calendar page. Um, now that it's May, we have a lot of great resources coming up on the calendar. Please take a look when you can. And Digital Academy, we want to remind you that the Digital Academy is here for you. We have a lot of great information there about our past presentations, videos from conferences and events. So take a look if you haven't already. We also want to let you know that we have two brand new resources available that we're very excited about. The first is our Employment Access Toolkit. This is a guide that we've been working on for quite a while now for people trying, that are needing to navigate the employment process with myotonic dystrophy. This very comprehensive toolkit reviews how to find a job, navigate the employment process, assess your readiness to work, how to write a resume and cover letter, and much more. So we encourage you to visit our website to download a copy of the toolkit. We also have recently produced a resource guide for people living with myotonic dystrophy around health insurance considerations. So this guide will help you understand how to get your medical treatments and claims approved, how to advocate for delivery of healthcare services and treatments to enhance your health and well-being uh, and that of all people living with DM. So please uh, visit our toolkits and resources page to view those resources. If you aren't already aware of our DM Family Registry, we definitely encourage you to take a look. The link is posted here. This registry is a very important effort so that you can understand more about those living with myotonic dystrophy and for the research community to also identify people that are living with myotonic dystrophy and their information that can help inform trials and future, future research efforts. So as somebody who is registered for the registry, you have access to this data. And um, if you'd like to register, please look at the link on the screen, myotonic.org um, slash myotonic.dystrophy-family-registry. And uh, we will email out these slides at the end too. So if you'd like to visit that link later on, um, we encourage you to do so. Just a quick plug for the rest of our webinars. We have scheduled Friday afternoon webinars at 12 o'clock p.m. Pacific for the next five to six weeks. We have next Friday, Caring for the Caregiver, and the Friday after virtual chair yoga, topic to be announced, gene editing for DM, and exercise for the DM community coming up. Our past two webinars of the past few Fridays are also located on this link. You can, you can view the slides and the recordings. We definitely encourage you to take a look if you haven't already. Both of these topics are very important, especially for COVID-19 and what, everything that's going on in the world right now. So we definitely encourage you to take a look and listen to these recordings. Next Friday, May 8th at 12 p.m. Pacific, we will have Caring for the Caregiver, which will be presented by Valerie Ochoa of the Southern Caregiver Resource Center in San Diego. This important webinar will help identify and learn how to manage your responsibilities as a caregiver um, and help you understand the emotional challenges and how to cope with that. So if you have not already registered, we encourage you to do so at the below link, the Friday afternoon webinar series link, as you registered for the webinar today, and you will receive a registration email from that. Last but certainly not least, we are very excited to premiere a food preparation contest um, in partnership with Leslie, 
who will also discuss this in a little more depth towards the end of the webinar. But this exciting contest will help you show off your skills and um, hopefully create a little sense of community in, um, with everything that's going on right now and help people feel a little more connected in, for, in the form of a virtual um, cooking contest. So we encourage you to create a video of five, months or, five minutes or less demonstrating an easy pr to prepare dysphagia friendly meal, identify the ingredients in your meal um, and the tools and create a video of that. So you can see the instructions on the screen. And we are lucky also to have some guidance from Leslie about how to do so. So on this screen, you'll see um, that Leslie will be hosting a tech session, tech support session next Thursday, May 7th. And the information and login information for the tech session is located at myatonic.org slash food dash preparation. So if you're interested in participating, please consider joining the tech support session. And the deadline to submit video, video entrance, entries excuse me, is Tuesday, May 12th. So you have about a week and a half to um, consider if you want to participate or not. So we're very excited about this contest and we hope that you will participate. So on to today's webinar, food preparation for the DM community. We are very, very lucky to have Dr. Leslie Krongold and Jessica Nussbaum here as our speakers. If you have questions during the, the presentation, please type your questions in the chat box of GoToWebinar, and we will provide them to our speakers at the end, time permitting. If your question isn't answered, we will make every effort to email or you a response to your question. And some quick resources that you should have received when you registered for the webinar, but if you didn't, the MDF Cooks is a great guide for easy to cook recipes that are dysphagia and DM friendly. And the Medical Glossary is an also great resource from our website that you can use to um, understand terms around myotonic dystrophy and, and that's some of the more complicated verbs that we might use. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Leslie Krongold, and very Pleased to have her today. She's such an important and integral part of our DM community. She is the Northern California Support Group Facilitator and has been for many, many years. She's the host of the Glass Half Full podcast, which you can see her link listed here. And she previously worked as the Outreach Director for Myotonic for three years. She helped launch our support group program many those years ago, and we're very grateful for that. So I'm Super excited that she's here today. Uh, I know that she knows so much about this topic and we are so grateful that she is able to share her experience with us and um, with the community. And I would also like to introduce her partner, Jessica Nussbaum. Jessica is a professional marketer who enjoys the joys of challenge and challenges of cooking for family and friends. And I'm very excited to have Jessica here today to help with um, this webinar. So without further ado, I'm just going to switch it over to them. One second. Okay, great. Thank you, Leah. So, hi, I'm Leslie, and I have GM1, and I was diagnosed about 22 years ago, just before I met Jessica, who is my spouse. Here. Hello, everyone. When we met 22 years ago, I had you know, a few symptoms, mostly the hand myotonia. But over the years, I've certainly experienced a number of key features of this condition. But one of the most annoying ones has been dysphagia or swallowing difficulty. So this webinar is going to touch upon this, dysphagia, and we're also going to uh, explore nutrition, but the focus is really on food preparation that is both nutritious and dysphagia friendly. And we're going to kick off a cooking video contest, so please stay tuned until the end. Neither Jessica nor myself are healthcare professionals, and neither of us have professional cooking experience. But we have learned a lot over the years to help me eat and enjoy meals that keep me in good health and hopefully maintain healthy immunity. And while we're all hunkered down for our safety, now is a great time to pick up a few new kitchen tips and unleash our creativity and your creativity since you may be limited with the foods you normally purchase. I know we certainly are. 
So back to dysphagia. Uh, Leah just talked about the family registry, and this is uh, where I got the graphic. So according to the uh, Myotonic Foundation's patient registry, more than 49% of adults with DM1 or DM2 have dysphagia. And by the way, I've heard this word pronounced two different ways, dysphagia and dysphagia, and by different healthcare professionals, I prefer saying dysphagia. So that's how I'll continue to use it. The foundation has additional resources on the website, and these links hopefully will work when you get this uh, slide deck. So Leah mentioned the cookbook. There's also a webinar we did several years back with a man named Dr. Michael Grower, who literally wrote a textbook on dysphagia. And then there's a breakout session from one of the conferences where uh, Jessica and another uh, caregiver gave some uh, food demonstration. So the origin of the word dysphagia is from Greek. Dys means difficulty or disorder, and phagia means to eat. And the condition which affects people not only with neuromuscular disease, but also people with multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, stroke survivors, survivors and also many people, once they're in their quote-unquote golden years, have difficulty. It refers to the sensation that food is hindered in its passage from the mouth to the stomach. So if you view the webinar with Dr. Grower, you'll learn more about the mechanics of it. But for now, I'll just tell you there are three different types or phases of dysphagia, oral, pharyngeal, and esophageal. And hopefully I'm pronouncing those correctly. I, I don't use them in everyday conversation. So oral refers to the problems with using the mouth, lips, and tongue to control food or liquid. And pharyngeal, the problem is in the throat. And with esophageal, it's a form of dysphagia where the underlying cause arises from the body of the esophagus, the lower esophagus, esophageal sphincter or a cardio of the stomach and it usually is due to mechanical causes or motility problems and as I understand I mean you can have issues you know in all three of these areas it's not necessarily progressive and it's not um, limited to one area so these two graphics give you an idea of some of the symptoms or warning signs of dysphagia. And I suspect many people do not realize that having some of these symptoms is indicative of dysphagia. And as you may know, we often get our advice about dealing with swallowing difficulties from a speech therapist. For example, Maybe you've heard tip your head down when swallowing or don't talk while eating. Further complicating the swallowing process, at least for me, is also jaw muscle weakness. So my bite has often shifted so that my top teeth, all, my top teeth only touch my bottom teeth on one side of my mouth. So obviously, for me, all of this happened gradually. Ironically, I stopped craving certain foods without much thought, but later realized something like salad or pizza was just too difficult to chew and swallow. I realized I expended more energy trying to consume the food, and that impeded my ability to enjoy it. And I found myself drawn to really soft foods like mashed potatoes or hummus. And you have to struggle while I ate those, and they were particularly easy to eat when I was fatigued. So for me, the dysphagia severity varies. If I've had a good night's sleep and feel pretty healthy, 
I'm able to eat more challenging foods, but if I'm tired, I just sort of lose strength or the energy. My tongue moves more slowly in my mouth. Food particles get stuck in the pockets in my mouth and I'll cough or have a bout of choking. I've implemented a lot of changes over the years in how I eat as well as what I eat. So no talking during a meal, only chewing small amounts of food at a time and slowly and tipping my head or the chin tuck chin tuck to, you know, to swallow all help. So let's talk a little about nutrition. One cannot live only on smoothies or hummus, although maybe some of us try to do that. We need a varied diet though, and our diets vary for a number of reasons. So I am not a nutritionist nor a registered dietitian, but I've learned a bit about nutrition over the years. And by the way, the person you would want to consult with about your nutritional needs would be a registered dietitian. They have the appropriate training. Anyone can actually call themselves a nutritionist. So the definition of nutrition, and this is from Wikipedia, is that the diet of an organism is what it eats, which is largely determined by the availability and palatability of foods. So for humans, a healthy diet includes preparation of food and storage methods that preserve nutrients from oxidation, heat, or leaching, and that reduces risk of foodborne illnesses. So cooking methods do have an impact on the nutritional quality of food. And the seven major classes of nutrients are carbohydrates, fats, fiber, minerals, proteins, vitamins, and water. So nutrients can be grouped as either macronutrients or micronutrients. Micronutrients are needed in smaller quantities than macronutrients. Macronutrients include the carbs, proteins, fat, and water, as well as calcium, sodium, potassium, magnesium, phosphorus, and sulfur. And micronutrients include seven essential plant nutrient elements that are boron, zinc, manganese, iron, copper, and here's a word I have never heard of until I did this research, molybdenum, mol molybdenum, um, and chlorine. And those uh, micronutrients constitute in total less than 1% of the dry weight of most plants. And molybdenum is an essential mineral found in high concentrations in legumes, grains, and organ meats. And it activates enzymes that help break down harmful sulfites and prevent toxins from building up in the body. So all of it doesn't really tell you what to eat. When I was growing up, we were taught about the food pyramid, which I remember at the time in the 70s was produced by the Dairy Council. So they had a real investment in uh, getting you to, you know, drink lots of milk and eat cheese. And these two graphics represent how the USDA's food guidance has changed over the years. And a, I thought this was very interesting because, um, you know, because it has changed a lot. I mean, nutrition is a science and we continue to learn more about food and its impact on our body. It's not really like they keep changing our minds. I know it can seem confusing. You know, one year you're being told to eat eggs and the next year they're saying egg, eggs are bad. So today if you do a search, an internet search for food pyramid, you'll have a huge list of pyramids to check out. Many of them are created or sponsored by entities that have a real 
investment in telling you what to eat, like the Dairy Council. But there is something called the Dietary Guidelines for Americans that is published every five years. It's been um, published since 1980, and it's a joint uh, venture or joint work by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the USDA, and the U.S. Department of Health and Social Services. And in their most recent study, which was 2015 to 2020, and it's available at the health.gov website, they lay out a suggested healthy eating pattern. So, you know, maybe they're sort of moving away from the pyramid and giving you a little more uh, specificity. So here you have, uh, they're referring to it as a healthy eating pattern. And here they're modeling how food should be of varied, varied colors. Uh, maybe you've heard, you know, eat a rainbow of food. Uh, and they also are representing the portion sizes on a plate. And there's a lot of literature out there about um, my plate, where it'll show, you know, different sections of the plate, how much protein, how much vegetable, etc. And this is where they start to introduce the term nutrient dense, which I'll address in a few moments. On this graphic, they mention the types of food to avoid due to their high sugar, sodium, and fat content. To know that these are saturated fats. We still eat fat in our diet, but healthier ones such as avocado. And in this graphic, they're recommending substitutions. So meal A looks like you know a fettuccine alfredo or something with lots of cream and cheese, and meal B is uh, a healthier uh, pasta with more vegetables and less cheese. So research suggests that the standard American diet, which is referred to as SAD, S-A-D, is energy rich, meaning that it's high in calories and nutrient poor. And the basic concept of nutrient density is the amount of nutrients you get for the calories consumed. And there are a lot of lists that I've seen in different magazines and on the internet of, you know, what are the 10 best foods? Which foods have the most nutrient density? And this is just one example that I found. It's from the USDA website. And, um, you know, this is not exhaustive because I know berries are a lot of fruits that are nutrient dense and they're not listed here. But some of the, um, all nutrient dense foods contain vitamins, minerals, complex carbohydrates, lean protein, and healthy fats. And some of the examples are whole grains, low fat or fat free milk products, eggs, peas, beans, and nuts. And here you see quinoa, walnuts, sweet potato, Brussels sprouts, cantaloupe, kale, salmon. And I'm reading these for the people who are maybe calling in on the phone and can't see the slides. So the American Heart, in, uh, Heart Association, and both of these graphics are from that organization. Here they attempt to differentiate highly processed foods, which are unhealthy, from other foods that are processed to a lesser degree, such as fortifying with vitamins like cereal or packaged to have a longer shelf life. So in a way, they're saying, you know, just because it's quote unquote processed food doesn't mean it's bad. It's how much processing exists and what is the nature of the processing. I've always thought of processed foods as coming from a box or a bag, not from the produce aisle. But some packaged soups, for example, may not have added sodium. You've probably seen no sodium added or low sodium. So they're perhaps healthier than foods with the added sugars, sodiums, and sodium and fats. And basically, I've come to think of food as medicine. 
And the healthiest medicine has compounds to help you with minimal or no adverse side effects. I know many of the foods I grew up eating had adverse side effects for me. And I guess in my my uh, diet journey, I've come to uh, look at everything I put into my body as, you know, how is it serving me? What benefits does it have for me? So I do have uh, my favorite food pyramid. And this one I discovered several years ago. It's uh, by Dr. Andrew Weil. And I find it to be pretty sound. I especially appreciate that mushrooms have their own category because mushrooms are really unique. They're not a plant, they're not an animal, and they're packed with nutrients that have amazing health benefits. Just make sure you cook them. So you see the bottom, the foundation of this uh, food pyramid, vegetables and fruits, and I eat a lot of green leafy vegetables and I eat a lot of berries. So I've talked a little about dysphagia nutrition, now to what I actually eat. My diet has been primarily plant-based for over 30 years, and when I gradually stopped eating meat, my gastrointestinal problems almost disappeared. And a few years ago, when I switched to eating smaller, more frequent meals, my GI system radically improved. So I basically eat fresh organic foods, and you know, it's hard to avoid some processed foods, but I try my best. So we have a, a video that I'm going to play now. Uh, Jessica and I put this together, and there are a few places where I will read the text on the screen uh, for people who can't see it. Hi, I'm Leslie. I'm Jessica. And this short video will introduce you to a few foods that Jessica prepares for me on a regular basis. The staples she makes, I use in different meals, which I prepare myself, as additions to simple dishes like oatmeal, eggs, or an open sandwich. The three dishes include oatmeal, hummus, and a casserole. They're simple dishes, yet easy for Leslie to chew and swallow, and are tasty. Plus, I include a few tips and tricks. Staples in my diet include mushrooms, as I already told you, cooked and then pulverized. I eat a lot of radishes, roasted till they're very soft, they're like butter, and bell peppers, roasted and then chopped into small pieces, and greens, lots of greens, all fresh and organic. Okay. So they're pulverized, often using an immersion blender. Savory oatmeal. Using a pressure cooker takes less time to make the oatmeal, but other pots, like a crock pot, work fine and you cook it overnight and use a wonderful ratio of oatmeal to liquid. And every day, one of my five small meals includes savory oatmeal. I add radish, peppers, greens, mushrooms, and tahini, which is sesame seed um, butter. I put the bowl into the microwave for one to two minutes and stir everything together. And don't knock it till you tried it. <laughs> Hummus. It's a savory dish made from cooked mashed chickpeas blended with tahini, lemon juice, and garlic. But you can use any type of bean, not just chickpeas. This recipe includes white beans, walnuts, lemon, garlic, herbs, and olive oil. So we use cannellini greens. and put them into a mixer. And this is basil and thyme. Basil and thyme. 
And Jessica eats up some walnuts. See the little brown marks there? I consider that good enough. Turn it off. Olive oil, you know, I would always say put as much as you feel like you need. Um, both from like a health perspective, but then also from a texture perspective. Final ingredient, and this is some Lapsan Suchon salt that I made to give it a little smoky flavor. can always push down the sides too. And if you wanted a lot more soupy without putting in more oil, you could add in vegetable stock or something like that, or just water. Hmm, salt? A little more salt, and maybe a little more pulp for icing because I got a piece of that. Okay, but oh, good. So. Could you do the same process with one of those bullets? What are they called? Ninja? You could. Um, you know, each tool has its own things, right? So, for example, one of the reasons why I like this smaller prep is that it's hard to do what I just did in, like, a, a regular size Cuisinart. Um, and a blender could do it, too. But that also, both the blender and um, the magic bullet or whatever that's called, the Ninja, um, in my opinion, it takes more liquid, so it's just something you have to play with a little bit and get a feel for what, you know, what tools you have. But that would be my advice is that both blenders and ninjas tend to need more liquid. A casserole. Choose your vegetables. We used uh, summer squash, pulverized crackers. We used oat. Crackers, selected cheese, dairy or non dairy, and a protein such as lentil soup or a veggie or meat burger. Okay, so what is that device you're using? This is a salad master. It's made from it's from Salad Master is the name of the company too. Okay, so what else could you use if you don't have one of these? A mandolin or a cheese grater, I would recommend. Um, it doesn't have to be, so you can kind of see how small it is. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be this small, but I find that this is the most effective for baking. Off, if I make it, if I were to cook this, put this in any other type of meal. Um, and it would be, and if it was cut at a, a bigger grade, then I would want to cook it first before I added it to, you know, other ingredients or added it as an ingredient. That's probably good, huh? After the bottom layer of crackers and vegetables, Add a layer of cheese. Add your protein source. You may need to add more liquid, water or broth. And add another layer of cheese. Put it in the oven, bake at 350 degrees for 30 minutes. Looks nice and melted. And season with herbs or spices that you like and enjoy. And that casserole was really good, by the way. So, let's see. I think Jessica? Okay, great. All right, thank you very much for uh, for that video. And before I start, I just want to reiterate that I'm not a professional cook, I'm just a home cook. Uh, and also I've cooked for Leslie and I'd like to acknowledge that 
every individual with dysphagia has different needs, and I've tried to be as broad as possible in this presentation. So let's first talk about some of the takeaways from the video. The three recipes were simple. Um, these are our day-to-day -day go to meals and examples of those. And I do like to make sure that it's simple in the sense that uh, it can be reused. So if you remember the oatmeal uh, that Leslie was eating, she put in peppers, for example, that I had roasted uh, by itself. Those peppers can be used somewhere else also uh, in a dish. So that simplicity uh, is, uh, is something that I look to to help make it a lot easier for me to to cook on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, a second thing to note is that some of the things, the, some of the ingredients have been cooked uh, twice or even three times, I'll, I'll do that. Um, and that's just another way to take a look at, uh, at a recipe or, or, what, or at what you're doing uh, to make sure that it reaches, the food reaches the texture that you're looking for. Uh, and in particular, uh, if you think about the casserole, where we included the soup that was already cooked, uh, we cooked it again, right? And, and that makes sure that, that the, the lentils, for example, in the soup um, get a second go at some heat so they get a little bit more, uh, more mushy. Uh, and then creativity is important. So as Leslie mentioned in the video, the hummus that we created there was made with cannellini beans. You can use any type of bean I make you know, dips and spreads out of lots of different types of vegetables. Um, and that's just a fun way to be creative. And there are lots of ways that I find as a cook to be creative. And uh, I encourage you to explore, explore that side of yourself. And in terms of texture, I mean, that's really what we, the core of what we're doing as, as cooking, as cooks, uh, cooking for someone who has dysphagia. If you take a look at the graph over here on the right-hand side, uh, this is the international or from the international dysphagia diet, uh, what's it called? Diet standards in, initiative. Um, but this is one of, of many types of models that you'll see out there. You might be familiar with one that talks about levels, levels one through four, for example. Uh, the details aren't as important as just understanding that it's kind of a continuum. And I like this. Um, this graph here, because it has both drinks and foods on it, and the two meet in the middle where um, a thin drink would be uh, thickened and a kind of thick, chewy food would be pureed and liquidized. So yes, there are lots of ways to kind of cut corners when cooking, and, and I certainly do that uh, in different instances, but I encourage you to, not, uh, to avoid uh, cutting corners to make it boring. Um, and, you know, these are some ways to, to help you do that. Uh, so one thing is to emphasize spices. Uh, this really goes to understanding the palate of the person that you're cooking for, but spices, uh, I've come to think of them as kind of herbs and spices. And I have three buckets where one is, uh, powdered spices and herbs. Um, the, the second one are dried often full. So think of like a uh, dried basil. Uh, and then a third are fresh, uh, fresh herbs. And sometimes uh, cut up fresh herbs might not be very good depending on the, you know, the chewing and swallowing ability of the person that you're cooking for. So maybe you'll default, default to the powdered spices. Um, but don't, uh, don't skimp on spices because having flavors in the food is, is, uh, is very important to help you avoid making uh, making boring food. Um, the second thing that I wanna emphasize is the distinct flavors and textures. So it's easy for us to think that we could take a recipe and put it in a blender and make it uh, easy for someone with dysphagia to chew and swallow it. Absolutely, yes, you could do that. Uh, but you will run into the fact that it, it can become a very, boring and uh, and not really appetizing food. And we actually did that with a burrito uh, where we took you know, a whole burrito and tried to blend it up. And yeah, it was edible, but no, it was not, um, not very uh, distinct in the different flavors. And also it wasn't very visually appealing. So trying to make sure that you have those different textures and flavors 
in the mouth as you you know take a bite um, is also something that that I recommend. And in terms of visually appealing, again, my example was the the pureed uh, burrito, but but also think about what might uh, my, what might work on the plate. So are the juices, the digestive juices, both in our mouths and in our stomachs, start when we start when we see food and when we smell food. And so um, so making it uh, visually appealing um, is also something that uh, that is uh, a place that you could emphasize. Uh, reconstructing a recipe. So this is when I'm going beyond some of the day to day cooking that was demonstrated in the video and I'm looking for something different. So I can look for a recipe and say, yes, OK, this might be something that we can do. But as I'm reading the recipe, what I'm looking for are these three things. The first is to identify any potential problem ingredients or cooking methods. Uh, and for this, I'd be looking for um, ingredients where maybe I'd need to swap something out or cooking methods where I will choose a different way to do it. And examples of those are for, um, for swapping out an ingredient. Instead of having whole nuts, for example, I might use nut meal. Or instead of grilling mushrooms, I will go ahead and uh, saute them and um, blend them up in as we did in that in the video. So those are ways, those are things that I'm thinking of as I am reviewing the recipe and considering alternatives. I also recommend having a contingency plan. This is, I consider when I do this, when I reconstruct a recipe, I am uh, doing a bit of an experiment. So it sometimes it hasn't worked out, I'll be honest with you. Um, but if I think through it, the recipe, and I can see where, okay, I'm going to cook it for this lawn, but I know that I can cook it for that lawn with extra stock in it, for example, um, if uh, you know, Leslie has problems chewing and swallowing, then that's a contingency plan. And I let her know ahead of time, right? So I'll say, here, try this. Um, and then if she says it doesn't work, I'll, I'll say, okay, look, let me go put it in the oven, add a little bit more you know, liquid to it and, uh, and try again. Another contingency plan could be just pulling something out of the freezer um, in case it doesn't work out. So that final recommendation here is just to help minimize any anxiety that you might have, you both you and, uh, and your loved one who's, who's eating the food that you have. Okay. Yes, and finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about nutrition. So I'm not a registered dietitian, but I certainly do try to know enough about uh, the cooking aspect of food to help maximize the, the nutrition in it. Uh, the first thing noted here is eat local. We do hear this term often when we um, hear about environmental effects or carbon uh, issues. But the other part to, to note with Eat Local is that the sooner that a vegetable gets from the field to your table, the more nutrients it's going to have. So if I here in California am buying a tomato from Florida, for example, uh, the nutrition content is going to be less than if I buy it from a local farmer uh, at a farmer's market, just because of the time that it takes to get that tomato from Florida to my kitchen. So the same thing goes with once it's in the kitchen. So the sooner you can eat that vegetable, the more nutrients it's going to have. Um, in terms of how to cook, so microwaves are not bad at all. In fact, if you can cook food in a microwave, um, go ahead and do it. It's not going to degrade the nutrition. If anything, it could improve it. And it doesn't improve it because of the microwaves, but it improves it in, the, in terms of the time that it takes to cook the food. So nutrients are being often, not all the time, um, nutrients are being broken down as you cook the food. So microwaving takes less time. So microwaving is definitely an option uh, when considering uh, cooking. Um, in terms of water, uh, boiling is often something that I need to do in order to create food that's easy to chew and swallow. But that water uh, has sucked out the nutrients from the uh, vegetable that was in the water. So the key thing to note is you can try to use that water. It's not as if it's you know disappearing into the air, um, but with the nutrients in the water, include it some other way. So maybe that is something that 
uh, you put in, in the refrigerator and you can use as stock later. Or in the example that I gave uh, for the contingency plan, maybe you have something in the fridge like that that you can add to your dish if it needs to cook longer and you need to add um, some more liquid uh, to it. Uh, frozen is also good. So again, thinking back to the eat local example with the tomato from Florida, if that tomato goes directly to a processing plant where it gets uh, frozen, the nutrients in it are also frozen. And so if it travels um, as a frozen tomato, uh, you're going to have, you're going to preserve the nutrients uh, uh, for yourself once it gets to your freezer and onto your plate. So, so fro frozen is an option if you don't have, uh, you know, a lot of local fruit, uh, fruit and vegetables that you're looking at. And of course, we, we've all heard about how we should avoid deep frying, uh, but deep frying not only does it also degrade uh, the nutrition in the food, but it can um, ha add carcinogens. And that happens when the oil is uh, used and reused. So in general, I would advise avoiding deep frying where you can. Okay, thanks, Jessica. So uh, the final um, slide, this is you know about the cooking contest. And I hope that uh, some of what we have presented has inspired you to uh, you know play around with different meals, experiment, and try to uh, come up with an easy to prepare meal that is nutritious and dysphagia friendly. And you can shoot a video using your smartphone or if you have a video camera and you wanna make it five minutes or less, you wanna make sure it's easy to follow so we can all learn from each other and try to cook each other's favorite meals. And um, I'm gonna do a tech talk to help anybody who has questions about the shooting or editing a video on May 7th. And the uh, videos need to be submitted by May 12th and they'll be reviewed by a registered dietitian. So she'll do like a, an analysis of it that doesn't affect the whether you win or not. It'll just be helpful for other people to know how nutrition it, nutritious it is. And then all the videos will be voted on by uh, our community. So I really hope you'll, um, you'll be inspired and I'm here to uh, help any of you who, who need it. All right, thank you so much, Jessica and Leslie, we really appreciate your thorough conversation um, and these great tips and tricks. So uh, I just wanted to bring in some, there they are, Leslie and Jessica. Hi. There you go. Perfect. Okay. So we have some questions that came in through the course of the presentation. Um, the first question is, what can we use for a thickener? Yeah, I, I can take that one. Um, so, so Leslie does not need a thickener for liquids, and I'm assuming that this uh, question is, uh, you know, based on on liquids. Um, so there are certainly at least I'd say four or five uh, products out there that can help you thicken um, liquids. Uh, there also are some pre-made products, so you could get you know juices that are pre-thickened and so forth. So, so that's definitely one option. Um, in terms of cooking, some of the things that I do, um, one is that I could add a hard boiled egg, for example, or I can add uh, flour or, or just cook it longer um, to thicken it up. Uh, and then there are other types of uh, things like agar agar or uh, xanthan gum that you could add, which I haven't really done that much of, um, but that could also be an option for people. Great, thank you. Uh, another question that came in is, are there any cookbooks just for dysphagia friendly meals that you would recommend? There are some out there, I have not used them. Uh, you know, I think, you know, with this disease, uh, certainly in Leslie's case, it's been a gradual, um, you know, progression in terms of the dysphagia. So I've kind of learned along the way, but there are some cookbooks out there 
Um, I can't recommend any of them because I haven't uh, read them yet, but, uh, but there are some. If you just Google them, you'll, you'll find them. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, how much preparation time does it usually take to make the staple meal items? Uh, yeah, okay, so <laughs> I think for this, the, the ones that we do, so let's say it's four or five of them, so the mushrooms, the oatmeal, uh, the peppers, greens, and so forth, uh, I would give myself at least, you know, half a day a week uh, and then they're there for, you know, the whole week. So, and by half a day, I mean like, you know, two to three hours. So it's not too much time if you consider that it's used throughout the week. Um, but that's generally how much time I would say it takes me. Great. This is a question that came in for Leslie specifically. Leslie, do you eat 100% by mouth or do you supplement with peg feeding? Uh, no, I, I eat everything through my mouth. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question, what type of kitchen tools would you recommend that you use in your kitchen for the recipes that you discussed and for dysphagia cooking in general? Um, sure. So the main ones are going to be that um, e immersion blender or emulsion blender. I think you can Google both of them to show up. I'm not sure what the official word is for it. but uh, And then uh, certainly a Vitamix. A Vitamix is great. I really recommend that as a blender. You can use... Um, any type of a blender, but Vitamix is one that I would um, recommend. Uh, and then, let's see, I mean, there are other options too, but and any type of a Cuisinart or other type of blender, and then certainly a nice knife is good. Nice meaning? Be <laughs> <laughs> <He's> sharp. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jessica's wearing her myotonic shirt. I just want you to know. Oh, great. <laughs> Okay, well, those are all the questions that we have for today. Thank you so much, Leslie and Jessica. This has been a really great presentation. I know it's been helpful. And to everybody that's on the line, we will be emailing out the recording and the slides this afternoon or early tomorrow, so stay tuned for that. And as always, we welcome your feedback, questions, thoughts, concerns, so feel free to email us at info at myotonic at any time um, as your questions come up, and we hope you have a great rest of your day and stay safe. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Thanks.